Hey there. I'm really pleased to be able to share with you that I am going to continue my read aloud series of Navigating Early by Claire Vanderpool. It has come to my attention that my read aloud videos may be reaching a larger population than I initially realized. And I'm really happy to be able to offer this resource to anyone who is interested in listening to a great story being read aloud. So today I'm going to pick up where I left off back in March. I'm going to be reading chapter 9. So this is chapter 9 of Navigating Early by Claire Vanderpool. The rain was still coming down and I'd either have to put on my wet tennis shoes to go back to the dorm or take off my socks and walk in my bare feet. I stood at the door watching the rain make rivers on the window of the side door to the school, feeling the cold of the cement stairs creeping through my socks. Barefoot it was. Then I heard a woman's voice singing. It was a rich, soulful voice full of tenderness and heartache. Something in me hurt like a wounded joint that aches when it rains. The voice was coming from the basement. As I walked down a couple of stairs, it dawned on me that it had been a while since I'd heard a woman's voice at all. Oh, there had been the ladies from church who'd brought over casseroles after my mom died, but they usually spoke only in sympathetic whispers. The woman at the funeral home was old, and she smoked, so her voice was deeper than my father's. And there was Miss B, the librarian, but she spoke in a hushed librarian voice. No, I crept closer. This was the voice of a whole different kind of woman. She sang of wishing on the moon and begging of the stars. It was a song of dreams and longing. As I got closer to the custodian's workshop, I could hear a crackly, whirring sound and realized with some disappointment that the singing was from a record. I remembered what early Outen had said. He listened to Louis Armstrong on Mondays, Frank Sinatra on Wednesdays, Glenn Miller on Fridays, and Mozart on Sundays, unless it was raining. If it's raining, it's always Billie Holiday. I had heard of Billie Holiday, the jazz and blues singer, but I'd never really listened to her sing. Her voice was mixed. Oh, excuse me. Her voice mixed with the music like molasses with warm butter. I stood just outside the door, listening, glad I was out of the rain, when I recognized a familiar smell. Wood. Wood shavings. Cut wood. Split wood. I breathed in deeply. It smelled like my dad's workshop, and kind of like a soapbox car. Suddenly, I had a feeling I knew what Early was doing. I walked in, and there he was, leaning over the sweetie pie, laid out on a wooden frame. He had knocked out several sections of warped boards and was working at unscrewing the seat rigging. I opened my mouth to tell him thanks, but no thanks. I really wasn't serious about building a better boat. Her real name is Eleonora Fagan, Early said before I could speak. Whose real name? I said, irritated at how he just jumped into a conversation, making me feel two steps behind. Billy Holidays. I wondered if she changed it so people wouldn't confuse her with Eleanor Roosevelt, but I don't see how they could be confused because one's white and one's Negro. Do you know which one is white and which is Negro? Yes, Early, I know which is which. My irritation subsided a little. He was odd, but in a funny way. Plus, one is a singer and one was the president's wife. Yep, it'd be pretty hard to confuse the two of them. The room smelled not only of wood, but it was, but also of other shop items like kerosene, glue, and varnish. It was warm and homey. I picked up an oar and ran my finger along its rough paddle. That blade needs smoothing, Early said, handing me a square of sandpaper. Of course, it wouldn't be called a paddle. That would be too common and make too much sense. I began sanding. There was something reassuring about the rough splinters giving way to fresh smoothness underneath. Maybe her real name was Billie Holiday all along, but she had to earn it, just like pie. 
I didn't answer, not sure if I wanted to hear more about his imaginary story made up of numbers. Remember that part, Jackie? The part where Pi wants to go explore and his mother says to keep an eye on the stars? Remember that? And she names the North Star after him, Polaris. Remember? Yeah, I remember, I said, still standing. But he hadn't earned his name yet. Right. So you want to hear what happens next? No. The mathematician Mr. Blaine knows of, Dr. Stanton, he's going to present his theory next month about Pi ending. He says one number has already disappeared and eventually Pi will die out. Stop that! You don't know what you're talking about. Early moved quickly to sit on his cot. He grabbed a jar of jelly beans off the shelf, poured them out in, onto his bed, and started sorting them by color. I guess he did that to calm himself down. But at one point, he, was, he just quit sorting. His hands lay at his sides and he stared off into space. His eyes blinked and fluttered a few times. I wouldn't have called it a full-blown fit, but I knew he was having one of those seizures the boys talked about. Just as I started to think about that, maybe I should go get help, he came out of it. I know where he is, Early said, as if nothing had happened. Where who is? I was confused. Pi. The professor says Pi ends, but I know where he is. He's not talking about your character. It's the number that will end. But I could see that for early, they were one and the same. Sometimes he's hard to find for a while, but he always comes back. I always find him. Early kept sorting the jelly beans into neat groups of red, orange, yellow, green, and blue. Billie Holiday's voice trailed off, one song ending and another one beginning. Early replaced the jelly beans in the jar, then flipped his chalkboard around, revealing rows of numbers. See, it's right here that he gets on his boat. These numbers, see how they look wavy like the ocean? Three, two, eight, five, three, four, five, seven, six, eight. No, they don't look wavy. They're just numbers, and you're making up a story to go along with them. I get it. It's pretty creative. Early balled his fists again. They're not just numbers, and I'm not making up a story. The story is in the numbers. Look at them. The numbers have colors. Blues for the ocean and sky, green grass, a bright yellow sun. The numbers have texture and landscape, mountains and waves and sand and storms, and words about Pi and about his journey. The numbers tell a story, and you don't deserve to hear it. Early moved the record player needle, cutting off Billie Holiday in the middle of a heartfelt song. He set it back down on the crackling, empty space and sat on his cot with his back to me. I stared at his back for a minute. He was right. I probably didn't deserve to hear it, but I didn't want to go back to the dorm, and the lonely sound of the record crackling in the empty space made my heart ache as if it had been rowing hard for a long time. So these numbers, the wavy ones, what do they say? Early didn't turn around. His voice was quiet. That's where the sea gets rough. Part of Early's story, student of the ocean. The young navigator had set off by the light of the stars, but they were soon covered by clouds and the sea grew rough. Pi had lived his entire life next to the sea, and he knew it well. He knew its moods and winds, its tides and swells, the sound of its playful splash and spray lapping at the sandy shore, as well as that of its waves crashing against the rocks. The salt and brine had worked their way into every pore of his skin. He knew the sea, or so he thought. But as his voyage began, Pi realized he knew only what the ocean had let him know, what it had deemed necessary for him to know. But now, now that the ocean had allowed him in, it enveloped him with the fury and passion of a master teacher. And Pi had much to learn. The sea tossed him to and fro, making him cling to his little boat while he retched and heaved and shivered. 
until finally the sea dashed Pai's boat against jagged rocks and spit him out on the shore of a distant island. But Pai was angry and turned his back on the ocean. He didn't need a teacher. He would learn the lessons he wanted to learn, and he did learn that eating all of your provisions in a day will leave you hungry the next, and starving the next after that. That yelling at the stars through the night and sleeping through the day will produce a sore throat and scorched skin. And that kicking a wrecked boat will not fix it. But eventually his anger and pride subsided as fatigue set in, and he lay on the beach ready to learn. The ocean washed over his dry burnt body, rousing him from his delirium teaching him to look for fresh water in hollow stalks and to use the sap from plants to soothe his skin. The sea withheld food, teaching Pai to search the beach for crabs, hunt boar, and learn the sweet taste of good berry over the bitter taste of the bad. The ocean in its cycle of wind and rain pelted Pai, encouraging him to build a lean-to of reeds and leaves to keep himself dry. Over time, Pai's muscles grew strong and his mind stronger. He knew to find shelter when the colorful island birds ceased their chatter. A storm was coming. He knew that fish were easiest to catch in the calm of low tide. And he knew that a boat left wrecked on the beach will not fix itself. Rebuilding his boat brought new discoveries for the young navigator. He had a keen eye for the craft, carving, bending, lashing, and he found pleasure in the work, the way the wood of a fallen tree would take shape in his hands, the feel of running a rough sandstone over the wood to make it smooth. Through his labor, he discovered that a thumb is best not left under a falling hammer, and that sweat and aching muscles bring satisfaction and restful sleep. Finally, after Pi had learned much in the way of survival, as well as humility, the sea allowed him back. But Pi was still learning his place in the world, and he had not yet earned his name. That's it for chapter 9. Chapter 10 will be posted soon. Thank you.